Christmas is only a few weeks away and no doubt you're looking forward to the break to spend time with family and friends. Whether you're taking a driving holiday or popping down to the shops, you will likely be on the road at some point. During the Christmas and New Year period our roads have greater volumes of traffic, meaning greater risk for drivers and their passengers. When you get in the car over the break, I'm asking you to apply the skills you have learnt on the job to keep you and your loved ones safe. Not everyone on the road is paying attention, so it's even more important to keep in mind risks of speed, distance, fatigue and other road users' actions. So please, stay alert on the road, have a great Christmas and remember what's important to you every time you get behind the wheel. We're reminded every day of the importance of being responsible drivers. You know the messages, not speeding, wearing seat belts, driving to the conditions. And every day we see the results of those who've made poor choices in their driving behavior. So this video is not about all of that. It's about two people whose lives have been changed by road trauma. One who left his family at home and headed off to work one January morning. The next time he saw them was to identify them in the morgue. The other, a long-serving police officer who's had to knock on too many doors to give families the news they didn't want to hear. When you get the initial phone call, there's a myriad of thoughts that go through your mind in a, in a, literally in a split second. Um, do I know them? Are they a member of the community? At times, could it be your own family if they're out and about? What's the scene going to be like? How are you going to handle it? And then at the end of that is going to be, how's that going to affect myself personally or my family? It might be somebody from within the community my kids go to school with. Yeah, there was a triple, uh, triple fatal just outside of Mount Pleasant. Um, all three members of that uh, were part of the Eden Valley community um, and all had daughters wives, brothers, sons, um, in regards to that. There's sometimes a disbelief. Sometimes they won't believe you until they've actually seen the deceased themselves. But the, the ongoing part of that is that it never goes away. Um, it impacts on the community significantly. That one, you're dealing with the CFS who knew them. You're dealing with the local hospital and ambulance workers who knew them. Uh, the local crash repair who organises a tow, one of the members who had died in the crash uh, actually worked at his workplace, so their workplace is affected. I have probably been regional police officer the better part of 20 years. The hardest part to deal with is the advising the next of kin that they've just lost somebody dear to them. The flow on effects from that, just being able to, having to tell somebody is difficult. There is no easy way around it. There is no easy way and there's no soft way to get somebody into it. Um, it's not uncommon in regional areas to have the next of kin come to the scene. Um, and then you've got to deal with that, whether or not um, the person who has died is suitable to be seen. There's so many factors, but if you've got to explain to a family that their loved one has been killed in a car crash, um, the first thing they want to know is when can I see them? Am I able to see them? Well, at some times it's not appropriate for them to see them. So then explaining that, it can be anything from disbelief to apologies to out and out violence. Um, just that raw emotion that comes out, a disbelief. Delivering those messages, you have to be empathetic, keeping in mind that you're actually delivering a death message as well. You know what you've got to do, the fact is that you've got to get it out and you've got to get it out quickly and it's got to be understood. Um, they've got to know that the person that you've come to tell them about is dead and it's got to be clearly communicated but in an empathetic way. So it can be a very hard task. And then there's a fallout from that after that. You've got the local community. It might be uh, if they're an employee of an organisation within the area the fallout from that. The other side of the coin as well, dealing with the member of the public who might have been first on scene as well. 
the poor motorist who pulls up next to it to check and everybody sees all right, they're not expecting that to happen during their normal day's work. When you actually get to rest, and, and for want of a better word, that's when the demons start to come back. It's after the job or when you've got downtime. It might be when, you, when you're driving to tell the next of kin or just driving back to the hospital to do an identification or something similar to that. When you've got time to really think about it and you're not dealing with the logistics of the investigation and crash scene, that's when you've got time to think and, and that's when your emotions may come back in. Obviously, it's dependent on the scene. Anything involving children is particularly emotional. But probably the most um, emotionally charged collision that I've had to deal with uh, was actually one that I've been at major crash with and it was where a, a four-year-old boy got run over down at, uh, in a regional area uh, at Easter time. Um, those sort of things stick with you forever. Um, I don't think I'll ever lose uh, the images that I've got and, and the, the raw emotion from the family that I've got and the dealings with them over the time. Yeah, the day pretty much started like any other day. Um, I, uh, I got up to go to work. Um, kids were on school holidays, so uh, I'd, I'd let them, um, I didn't let them, they, they were still asleep when I, uh, when I left. Um, you know, got to work, uh, went about my normal day. I'd, uh, because I hadn't spoken to my wife, Mel, in the morning, I gave her a call about 10 o'clock. Um, and uh, she'd said that she had a few jobs to do in Mount Barker. Um, had an appointment, the girls had an appointment in my sister's hairdressing salon in the Barossa. Aspects about what happened that day are really clear. Um, I remember bits of it like, like it was yesterday. Um, you know, I'd gone to work um, uh, about quarter to two. My sister telephoned to say that Mel hadn't turned up for the appointment. Um, I then hopped on the phone, um, tried to call her on the mobile, tried to call her at home, um, couldn't get through. Um, I rang my sister back again, she still still hadn't turned up, so I started to get a, started to get a little bit a uh, little bit worried. Um, it was just uh, so unlike Mel to a miss an appointment, but then if she'd been held up or delayed. Um, you know, she would have she would have generally phoned someone to let them know what was going on. I remember heading home and and sort of and it's really hard it's hard to explain why, but I had this heading home in the car. I, I had this really uneasy feeling um, as I got closer closer to Mount Barker in particular that that something just wasn't wasn't quite right. Um, so I ended up calling into the into the police station. Um, again, not not really knowing what I was going to ask. Um, you know, as I said before, she, at this stage she just hadn't turned up to an appointment or hadn't been answering her phone. So I almost felt a little bit silly going into the police station. But I guess such was this feeling that sort of overcame me as I was driving home. That that you know, hang on, this this doesn't quite feel feel right so I um, explained the situation to the to the police officer behind the behind the counter um, she went away for uh, what seemed like five or so minutes came back um, said that she couldn't help me but there were two police officers that were out on patrol who were due back in the station shortly after that uh, I noticed the, the two police officers uh, walk through the through the door I could just see see the look on their faces. Yeah, I knew, I knew that something had happened. Um, I was to find out later they'd actually been out trying to find our house where we live, um, hoping that, that I would be there to, uh, to tell me the news. So um, they called me into an interview room, um, asked me to take a seat, and then asked a whole heap of questions about the car, um, about Mel and the girls. Um, where they'd been going, uh, and then told me the news that there'd been a, uh, a crash and, um, and a fatality. So it sort of wasn't until 
uh, a little bit later after I'd sort of tried to sort of try to process what's what this guy's suddenly told you um, you know I'd, I initially thought that there'd been one one fatality and had all these things going through my mind um, trying to piece together who who it was that possibly would have passed passed away whether it was Mel my wife or um, you know one of the kids and if it was Mel, um, you know how how the kids cope without their mum, or if it was perhaps one of the girls, how would how would Mel feel knowing that she'd been in the crash that that killed one of her children? So I don't know. I, I just recall having all these um, all these thoughts going around in my head, which which seemed to take an eternity. But I guess in all reality, it was probably just a couple of seconds, and um, it sort of wasn't. It wasn't until that point in time that the police officer then sort of corrected me and said, no, there had actually been four, four fatalities. I find it really hard to describe to someone um, what, what goes through your head at that point in time. There's it's almost this feeling of, um, of, of suffocation, and, and I know it probably sounds, sounds silly, but it's just this... Um, it's just this feeling of hopelessness and and literally not not knowing where to turn, what to do, uh, what to think. Um, time passes and and you sort of realise you realise you know the gravity of of what you've what you've just been told. It's a real it's a um, it's a surreal feeling, I guess that. Um, that yeah, I, I to this day I still find it really hard to hard to describe uh, describe the feeling. You know, you leave home that morning, um, normal family, um, mum, dad, two kids, and a dog, and and you come home that night, and you know, life as you knew it before is 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 gone. Um, I remember waking up the next morning, and um, just for this that split second, just. Waking up and thinking, oh hell, that was um, yeah, that was pretty intense, and and quite quite literally, it was just a it was just a split second, and I guess um, uh, you know you sort of look over look over um, in the bed that uh, I guess um, you know your wife was in the 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 day before and and all of a sudden it sort of just comes flooding flooding back to you that uh, no it's um, certainly wasn't a certainly wasn't a dream there's certainly not a day that I don't go without um, thinking uh, about the girls or aspects of that day um, you know that in itself comes up uh, all the time um, you know there's birthdays there's Christmases there's Easter anniversaries, wedding anniversaries. Um, you know, there's there's reminders um, right throughout the year, um, and yeah, it's uh, it's it's a difficult time around Christmas. There's no there's no question about that. Um, as is you know a lot of other days, Father's Days and Mother's Day. So, um, but yeah, it it um, it occupies a lot of my a lot of my time thinking.